Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Jonas, and I now run Aura Cacao out in Grayton, California. Um, I went to RSI when I was a teenager, um, which was a totally transformative experience to meet other students like mine didn't get to do a deep dive in, you know, university level research. Um, at the time, I did a project on a power generation from vibrations using piezoelectronic technology. So kind of in the same way that you would power a piezoelectric wafer to generate vibration, running it backwards to actually power harvest. Um, mostly for use for like micro sensor systems that use very, very small amounts of power. We were interested in energy harvesting so that a sensor system could operate somewhere autonomously um, without the need for batteries. Um, so really cool project. Um, and that was in line. So I, I went to Stanford University for that for my undergrad and my master's, um, which both of them I did in mechanical engineering. I developed, by my sophomore year, I developed an interest in green building and energy systems. Um, so did a lot, did a lot on campus with all aspects of green building design, also went into public policy and, and like, you know, uh, looking, looking at working with the California Energy Commission and ways to decouple incentive for utilities to just sell more power because just selling more electricity is not the right kind of signal that we want to sell. Ascend for utilities when we're facing uh, global warming, we actually want to encourage energy efficiency. And so looking at how to send different price signals. Um, so I, there's been a lot of crossover for me in between like the engineering side of things and, and having the tool set to create technical solutions, but also realizing that so many of the challenges we're facing in the energy sector are far beyond the engineering side. And it's so necessary to cross over into the public policy side and in, into just like the human system side of things. Um, and so something that I think has always come into use for me is an ability to translate um, and understand complex technical problems and then present it to lay people and policymakers and, and, and other collaborators um, so, so that we could come up with good solutions and a lot of team building as well. Um, so I, I was in that green building world for a few years and then um, came across a topic that I had never considered um, by my senior year. Um, got to do a senior design project in, um, if, what was it? So it was, we, so I had actually gotten, we hadn't got, a friend and I had gotten an EBA grant uh, for green buildings. Um, and the project didn't move forward as fast as the grant was requiring us to spend the funding because of some university constraints on their construction budget. Um, and so we had to come up with creative ways to spend the money. And we're like, well, let's learn about green building in as many ways as we can. And I ended up traveling to Seattle, Washington um, to go to a conference on stove and cooking technology. Um, but it was cooking technology for affordable for developing world countries and it was my first and it was kind of a whole group of many people not actually with very much scientific background but who had spent a lot of time traveling to developing world areas and on kind of like international aid projects and seeing that so many people were struggling with actually sustainable sources of fuel for cooking and that there was a lot of deforestation resulting and such and so they had uh, set about with this mission of trying to build more energy efficient stoves and um, a lot of the stoves were really bad because they had very little scientific background. And we were kind of there and we're like, wow, this is a fascinating project. Um, you know, these folks have had a lot of on the ground experience, but they're missing the technical aspect. Um, so that, that really just like set my mind turning in a whole new direction of how can we use clean energy, renewable technology, to benefit folks who are energy impoverished and actually are paying really, really high prices, for example, to even charge a cell phone battery, you know, like 50 cents to charge your cell phone every time you charge your cell phone. You know, we don't even think about it. We just plug it into the wall and take the power for granted. Um, so that, that set a lot of motion for me. And I ended up joining that same friend that we had applied for the EPA grant with as an intern at a company called Patenko. Um, which if you've heard of the one laptop per child project, that was a big initiative about like, 
I don't know, 10, 15 years ago now. Um, you know, lots of money behind that project to get laptops to everybody. Interestingly, um, they didn't think about how they would power those laptops. So Patenko was founded to power those laptops. Um, and we were looking at a variety of human power devices, um, initially bicycles, but also hand pull generators. So I spent a summer exploring ways to do low cost human power generation to power those laptops. Ultimately, the whole project failed because it turns out that this was kind of like a design solution proposed with way, very little understanding of what the actual need was. Turns out that people actually weren't needing laptops. They were already using their cell phones to gain access to the same information. Um, and you know, many of the laptops didn't even have cellular chips embedded and that was the best way to get data, not by going to find a Wi-Fi hotspot somewhere. So interesting example of like an engineering solution, but not really connected to what the actual social problem was. So um, out of the failure of that, uh, my friend regrouped and um, he started a new company, Phoenix International, which I ended up working for on and off over the course of a few years while finishing my master's degree, um, which is basically a smart lead acid battery for entrepreneurs to charge in rural locations for uh, running small businesses. Um, and usually it was for charging people's cell phones, cell phone charging businesses, and also running lights. And through that, um, basically improving access to education and clean energy. Um, I left there and went to join another company, Greenlight Planet, um, which actually I have a little photo of the product, so I'll share my screen. Um, here we go. So uh, this is what I ended up being on the design team for. Uh, these are solar lanterns, um, basically taking a consumer electronics approach to making micro solar system. These, these units, for example, cost 10 to $20. So the idea was to get 10 to 12, 10 to $20 lithium ion battery, solar powered lights into people's hands. They're really high quality. I mean, I use these lamps um, to help replace kerosene. So um, again, providing people safer access to light and safer access to education. Um, this is kind of where it all like really started working. I was like, oh wow, we're actually doing the need finding on the ground, talking to people what they actually need and then designing a product specifically for them rather than like, oh, we think you guys need a laptop and oh yeah, we need to figure out a power system, you know, kind of, it started getting cohesive. This company has reached uh, many, many millions of people. Um, it's, it's very effective. Um, and I did not think I was gonna leave this job except that I became really passionate about chocolate. So I will, I'm just gonna, let's see, how do I stop this shit? There we go. Um, so my career took an unexpected turn. Um, I was traveling in Oaxaca, Mexico and learned chocolate making from an indigenous Zapotec elder uh, named Maria. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see you. Long time since I've seen you. How yeah. Good it's been so long. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm on headphones. Why? How is your business? <laughs> It's doing great. I'm having so much fun. Right, anyway. so, so, so we finally got him. Joanne's just very excited that we finally got you. Yeah. To present. I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah. So just diving into the good stuff about chocolate making. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I had realized at both of these companies was that, you know, my success as an engineer was dependent on these larger organizations you know, the ability of the founders to fundraise, the ability of the marketing and sales team to get our products out there. Um, I loved getting to do the engineering and I was also fascinated by all the other parts of the picture that made it work. And so when I encountered um, chocolate making, it wasn't initially going to become a career for me. I spent about two years just learning how to take this experience of traditional chocolate making I'd had and bring it home and just began doing DIY chocolate making at home as a hobby. Um, figured out, figuring out how to roast cacao beans, shell them, grind them, and temper and deposit them into chocolate bars. Um, I became especially interested in healthy chocolate. So chocolate with very little sugar, 
uh, like 85% the darker, 100% cacao, um, using coconut sugar as a sweetener, things like that. Um, kind of reformulating the recipe so that it was something that I really felt good about eating every single day. Um, because, it, you know, it actually turns out chocolate is extraordinarily good for you as long as you go light on the sugar. Um, and a lot of the research studies that have been done on cacao um, are starting to catch up with what those benefits are. Um, but they're all usually done on very dark chocolate, not the traditional candy that you'll find in the supermarket. Um, and when I started kind of taking this turn of making chocolate and, and talking about it as a healthy thing, people became really interested. And they're like, you should take these to the farmer's market and you should do this as a business. And eventually I was kind of like, you know what, maybe I should try it. I kept a job part-time at Greenlight Planet for the first couple of years of doing that. And that helped me pay the bills of my ever, ever increasing chocolate hobby. You know, I was getting more machines. I bought my first sack of cacao beans, um, kept diving deeper into that. Um, and again, the chocolate was really interesting because it was still linked to these communities um, in the developing world that had often very little access to resources. Um, so, you know, working with cacao farmers who have just a couple acres of farmland somewhere and us buying from them was helping bring their cacao to market and us paying good prices um, was really trying transforming their lives. So I saw the social impact that was possible with cacao, especially because so much of it is still based off of this, you know, so much of the chocolate industry is, is largely unchanged from how it was several hundred years ago, um, you know, which is this colonial exploitation of tropical goods and, and really no respect for the people or the land um, that were involved in growing it. So in many ways, I realized how backwards the chocolate industry still was and that there is a lot of room for a whole new business model um, that's much more regenerative and positive for the earth and its people. So I kind of set about to combine my ability in engineering and, and all the tools to make chocolate making and to, to scale a small scale chocolate enterprise into a large scale chocolate factory and simultaneously build the business, the marketing, the sales, the financing, all of that um, to support that hobby and that engineering. And so I am, let's see, I founded Firefly in 2014. So we're eight years, this May will be eight years in as a business. Um, we just renamed to Aura Cacao last November. And um, excitingly, we just moved. So now we are making, I moved out of a 2,000 square foot facility into a 10,000 square foot facility. And we're in the process of building that out to a very modernized, largely automated chocolate factory uh, here in the heart of Sonoma County, uh, which is wine country. If, if any of you are familiar with wine, you've probably had Sonoma County wine. And we actually are in a property that is um, part of a former winery and used to be used for aging wine barrels. And so we have a lot of big equipment in here and I'll show you a little bit of what we're working with um, and show you how I'm applying some of my engineering skills with that because practically every machine I've taken apart completely, I've hacked it in some form, I've fixed the electronics, I've programmed it, I've made a lot of mechanical changes. Um, I'll just show you some of the iteration. So this is just a quick video taking you to Cacao Farm and the community in Guatemala that we sourced from to give you some of like the reason and the backstory of like why all the other stuff. Um, that's a cacao pot being opened, the fresh cacao fruit. That's cacao being roasted the traditional way. Um, or it's being canned in the cacao paste, which is an interesting one. And that's a liquid cacao drink. Um, most people drink it down there. Right? So that's just a snapshot of like where I go on my travels um, and, and the communities that the cacao comes from. Um, now let's go to... Um, where should we go? Let's go to the space. Um, shoot, I was hoping I could just share my entire screen. I wonder why I can't do that. Um, share screen. What if I share the whiteboard? Does the whiteboard show everything? No, I have to open it all up first. Okay, well then, that is a little different flow. One second while I pull up these photos. <laughs> 
Okay. Open everything up. So now we are in this building that I was saying is built in 1947 and originally just a warehouse. So we are hard at work turning it into a chocolate production facility. So, oh man, I might have to. Okay. Um, shoot, I've never had this problem before where I can't just share my whole screen. Um, what are you guys seeing right now? Um, the front of a building. Okay, you are seeing a building, great. Yes. Um, okay, so that's the building we're in, um, the Hallberg Hall. Um, and we, we are kind of off in the back of that. Um, let's see, uh, okay, every image is gonna make me share it individually. <laughs> I should have put these in the PowerPoint, okay. I'm trying to think what the best way is to do this now because I have a lot of different images. Um, is there a way I can condense this into a slideshow? Hmm. Oh, Zoom. <laughs> well, okay. I'll just I'll just pick one or I'll just pick a few images to share rather than all of them. Uh, this is the inside of the building that we're building out. Um, you can kind of see that's. Are you, are you seeing it like a big yep. hall with an arch? Okay, so that's that's what we're building out. Um, okay, you sell that one instead. Okay, great. Um, and well, so 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 challenges. So so you know we're basically taking that traditional process that you saw of roasting the beans and shelling them and grinding them into an industrial scale. Um, so one of the machines that I'm working on right now, which has been pretty exciting, has been a uh, chocolate winnower. So this is a machine that is, is shelling cacao beans. Um, and I'm just going to open a few videos. Uh, and so it breaks the cacao beans into pieces. And then oh, this is so tricky to share. OK. Um, so where is it? Okay, I'll share this video real quick. So here you can see. How did they pop We had just broken all these beans. And these are entering a cracker. So basically, the idea of the cracker is it lightly shears the beans so that the shell and the inside of the beans separate. And then what we want to accomplish from there is um, we want to get cacao nibs out of it. So now you'll see this video um, of the cacao nibs. The way that it's separating out, it's separating out the beans and the shell is by air flow. The shell is really light. So basically the, there's like five different sizes going down, smaller, smaller pieces. And then once it's all the same size particle, it's pulling the light shell out and the heavier nib stays. And so we're, we're trying to get really good yield on the process, right? Because you don't want to suck up any small pieces of cacao nib because that's lost cacao that could be used in product. And you don't want any shell in your nib stream because that's not what chocolate is. It's, it's actually the inside of the bean. Um, so that is... The cool thing about this is that this is a machine that was built in 1968 in Germany. And we actually bought it from an old Hershey's plant in Illinois and have been restoring it. We built a completely new control system for it um, and have just been getting it up and running. And the, it's such a good mechanical design that they're actually still building and selling the same design, the same company is. Um, so you can still buy it today. Um, but it's it's been just really fun to restore this machine. And I'll give you a picture of what the whole machine looks like. So you have a visual. There it is. Um, so you can see it's it's tall. These are 20 foot tall ceilings. Um, that's the, the forklift in the corners there is holding the hopper full of roasted cacao beans over it because we don't have our, our um, automated system yet for feeding it. Um, and then all those levers on the side of it, they control the airflow and we have variable speed drives on, on the exhaust air here and on the vibration um, and on the cracker and such. So there's a lot of, 
a lot of the engineering that ends up going into chocolate making, you know, is, is these very complex systems that we're trying to reach a steady state in, right? We're feeding the cacao beans in and any change in, in the input that even with like different beans requires slight adjustments to all the settings. So we're constantly trying to produce the optimum results um, while the whole system's in moving. So there's a lot, a lot to do with control laws um, and, and just understanding how all the variables impact each other and controlling variables um, just to make sure that we can consistently create good product. Um, where this takes us ultimately is to our chocolate chips. So um, a lot of the market for 100% cacao is originally sold in just these big blocks of chocolate and people who are interested in making drinks, they actually had to chop up these blocks of chocolate um, and then put them in hot water. And I realized that chocolate chips would be much more usable. Um, but scaling up from, um, there's actually like practically no small scale chocolate chip manufacturing tools out there. So I had to build my own. And then now finally we've gotten to a scale where we can afford um, a large scale chocolate chip making machine. Um, but both of those, like the small scale and the large scale is, is very unique in the marketplace. So it's kind of given us a niche in the industry. Um, and, and there's practically nobody making chocolate chips from the bean in the way we are. There's a lot of actually producers, but they're often melting down bulk chocolate produced by very, very large producers of chocolate. Um, so for us to be roasting the beans, shelling, and then producing chips from them is actually pretty unique um, in the marketplace. And we, we mostly do it direct to consumer. So we, send, we make our products all in-house, and then we send it directly to people through, who buy it through our website. Um, so that's kind of the model we're working off. I'll show you the chocolate chips machine because that's really fun. Um, small. Okay, let me pull that. I'll show you the first generation chocolate chips machine and then um, where it's gone since. Okay, cool. So there's one video, there's another video. Okay. So this is what it started off as. Um, this was my very first prototype, just to see if I could produce chocolate chips um, at all, like what that could potentially look like. So I have this pipe of uh, tempered chocolate. I'm trying to find the video so I can play it. Let me close that out. I have this pipe of tempered chocolate coming out, and I just had a local machine shop drill a bunch of holes into it. Um, to see if I could then use a piston actuated on a timer to uh, deposit chocolate onto a moving belt. So this is a video of that. And you can see, there it is, we're producing chocolate chips. Um, this only lasted for about five minutes before the pipe froze up though. So I realized that doing this without a jacketed, hot water jacketed pipe or a heating element on it um, wouldn't go for very long. Um, so I'll show you kind of the many prototypes later of that version. Um, we have this thing where ended up creating this whole head with nozzles. These are actually plastic injection molding nozzles that I ended up using. You can see the heat tape on it and there's a whole row of them now. It's doing a pretty good job depositing the chips. You can also see the controller closets the belt. So that while it's depositing it, so that we don't have more bubbles, and then it moves along. Um, you can see the consistency of the chocolate, I'll play it again, has to be just right so that it separates from the chip and doesn't leave like a long drip mark. So there's a surprising amount of variables here, um, but we were able to make it work. Um, and I'll show you the, at the time, the end product. Um, here it is. This is chocolate, finished chocolate chips rolling off the end of our belt there. So is this going on? And uh, yeah. I didn't realize that somebody's talking on that, but um, yeah, this was our homemade effort at building chips. And for several years, um, we ran all of our production on this. It was a headache to get the chips lined up and running, but we always managed to pull it off and would produce a thousand pounds in the course of a day and then have chips to sell. Um, now 
we are in a building that has a professional chips line and I'm trying to find, let's see, where is that? That is here. This, this machine is really exciting. It's totally mesmerizing to watch. It uses really cool technology that's actually just come to the market called the roller depositor, which is a continuous style of chips. So you'll notice the chips depositing. So you'll notice that the bells never actually constantly feeding chocolate through this roller and then it comes out through this little thing. Quite a good job. That's an early test video, but it actually makes very uniform chips. And I'll give you two more views of that. Here's, here's kind of a top view of the chips in production. There they are going down the line. And they're basically going into a 100 foot long cooling tunnel. So that by the time they reach the end of that tunnel, they are fully solidified as chocolate chips. Um, and so here is the end of that belt. Um, and the chips, really, really nice chips peeling off. Right now there, we're collecting them in boxes, but in our, now they're actually going onto a conveyor, which feeds a big tote that can hold like 1,500 pounds of chips. So that is, my intention with showing you all those videos is to kind of give you a sense of the iterative process that we've been through and, and how much each step of the process we've had to like experiment and fail and put together all the different components. And that has ultimately given us like the know-how of like what machine to buy on a larger scale so that we can make the right decision and not like make the mistake of buying a machine that then doesn't work quite like we wanted to. Like we, we really built the experience that then let us purchase the right equipment at the scale and you know and then that lets us be a more efficient and lean startup because we're not making big mistakes um we're completely self-funded so we, we haven't taken outside investment to grow the company um and so everything has had to come from our sales and from our experience um and it's been really fun building all of our own chocolate making machines and it's also really nice now to go to larger machines that are built with the kind of volume that we're working with in mind and aren't failing in unexpected ways. And now, you know, we have procedures for maintenance and having the right backup parts and such in place. Um, so yeah, my, my world is very machinery heavy now as we have, as we're bringing on all these new tools to work with Cacao on scale to ultimately support that core mission of supporting the farmers and getting healthy chocolate to people. Um, there is a ton of really fun math problems and engineering along the way. I actually wanna build a, a kind of book of chocolate making math problems. If that's something that people are interested in, definitely let me know. But I, I'm constantly, you know, the, a lot of it is like volumetric and flow rate related. Um, you know, we have, so those nibs, they get fed into these grinders um, where there's actually some pretty cool chemistry going on as well in the flavor development process of chocolate. Um, and then once those grinders are done, they get pumped through a chocolate pipeline into these big tanks. And then they go through the tempering machine into that chips depositor. So there's, there's a lot of number crunching in terms of how long does it take to fill the tank? You know, how much energy input do we need to put into the water jacket pipeline to keep it at a steady state? Um, a lot of, a lot of neat control problems. So, um, yeah, that's, it's not, none of it is often as rigorous as the kind of engineering that I used to do in school, getting my master's degree, you know, I was building robots and designing circuit boards and things like that. Um, but it is still constantly needing my expertise and it, it, it's very empowering to like go into the electrical cabinet of any of our machines and be able to take a part look at the part number you know look at the circuit board i like actually <laughs> i have a circuit board here on my desk from a machine that broke and this circuit board i'll, I'll give you as an example costs like three or four hundred dollars to replace but with uh with my dent benchtop tools, I was really quickly able to realize that it was actually just one of these relays that was broken. This relay cost like two bucks. So I ordered the relay from China, replaced the relay, and we just saved 400 bucks. You know, as like really, really quick and easy example of something. Um, and 
the chalk chocolate making machinery is really expensive you know it's like super custom stuff in the food industry and um, I actually source a lot of my chocolate making equipment in China because so with the solar companies we were doing manufacturing of our solar products in China so I spent like a year going to China 10 times and building all these relationships with factories and like learning how to work in the Chinese culture and such and now we've bought the majority of our chocolate making equipment in China because it's like a third or the quarter of the price for much of the same stuff you just have to be very very specific about exactly what you want and how it needs to work and you know apple's produced in china apple computers so it's it's not like you can't get quality out of china you just need to know how to work with the engineers there to produce the tools that you then rely on um so yeah the engineering has been a crucial part of being able to run the startup in a lean way and not need to take outside investment and one of the reasons I've been so against taking outside investment for the company is having seen that at the two solar startups, how much autonomy you lose in terms of creative direction. You know, all of a sudden you're working with a whole team of investors and stuff that sometimes have different goals than what you do as a company founder. Um, and I really like that autonomy. I'm, I'm just somebody who works really independently, loves working with other people who work independently. Um, and so having that freedom that has kind of come through our ability to really keep the engineering know-how in-house um, and keep ourselves lean as a result has been essential. Um, we're actually ending up doing a lot of construction at our facility as well. Um, we've been going through this permitting process for the old building and it can be really expensive to get some of this stuff contracted out and built and you know it, many times our approach has been to find a contractor that's willing to teach us and teach us how to like run electrical to all of our machines and then sign off on the work rather than paying them to do all of it where we're paying somebody, you know, $150 an hour just to pull some wire through a tube. <laughs> like we could do that too. And along the way, we get to do all the math on like, well, how many wi wires can we run through the code, through the tube per the electrical code? And, you know, what's, what's the amperage that we can run through a certain wire and such. And then we know inside and out how the whole chocolate factory is built. Um, which in the end is really fun and really empowering. So I really love that freedom and, and the, the, to take everything apart and do everything ourselves that engineering has given us. And then, you know, the, again, translating that out into the world has been like the marketing and the sales part and learning, learning all those pieces of business. I would say those have been the most challenging actually, because I had zero background in those and kind of had to realize I had to get good at those in order to keep my love for tinkering with machines going and, and, and working with ever increasing sizes of cacao. So that's, that's kind of the real fast version of what we're up to here. Feel free to ask me some questions and um, I'm sure more stories will come out. Yeah, um, actually, so I personally was very interested. Um, my dad actually did a stint as the quality manager for um, a high-end chocolatier in uh, in Vermont. Oh. Um, so, you know, to throw some shade, um, I mean, I don't mean to really throw that much shade on other chocolate companies, um, but the man didn't eat like Ghirardelli chocolate. He thought it was, you know, he put that in the same category as Hershey. Absolutely. Uh, because if you put, because according to him, if you put vegetable oil in your chocolate, it's and not that, worth eating. That's one of the fun things about being in food is like food is an art form, right? Like there's all this engineering that's going into supporting how we make chocolate, but ultimately transforming a cacao bean into finished chocolate. There's so much chemistry, so many variables that, you know, we're just doing our very best to have a repeatable process. Um, that we can rely on and so that then the art form of it can arise and we can and we can really tune into like okay should we you know should we volatilize some of the acids that are coming off of the cacao bean for another hour will it taste better then you know and this very iterative experimental process there um and you you have to be opinionated in what you like to you just you know eat I, everybody kind of decides well this is the best chocolate, you know, this is what, what we want to offer. And then we look at the reviews and we see how people like it and get that kind of feedback. But yeah, the food world's fascinating. Yeah, he also never found um, a yogurt he actually enjoyed. 
Um, so he had to mix yogurt to make his own because that was the flavor profile he was looking for. Um, and I mean, I also would imagine too that you have a really good um, sense of taste and a really sensitive palate in order to be able to taste the differences between, um, you know, that you're trying to figure out where off, off flavors are coming from. Um, you know, is this the flavor profile we're looking for? Yeah, that's something I've had to train myself. And that's, you know, a key part of entrepreneurship is surrounding yourself with the people who have skills that you don't. Um, so one of my good friends is a professional chef and we would constantly do chocolate tastings and he would tell me like what he was tasting and I'd learned to, you know, you have to develop a vocabulary for describing what you're tasting so you can talk about it with other people and you can troubleshoot it, you know, it's like, where is that particular flavor coming from? Um, ring, ring. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So that's actually, I would say not something I was good at at all and have had to get good at. And now it's actually part of our draft staff training, you know, because nobody really walks in the door with a, a developed palate for tasting cacao, you know, like we have to taste the cacao and the roasting and decide, oh, is that going to make a good chocolate or do we need to change the roast profile? So you kind of even have to learn how the flavors transform over time and across processes. Yeah, no, and I know, um, I also know people who work in the beer industry, um, and they can tell you exactly what, where the problem is, um, in terms of, is it, is it in the draft of the beer or is it a production issue when they taste an off flavor, which I think is wild. They're like, oh yeah, no, this is definitely a water quality issue. And I'm like, I don't even understand how you know. And okay. versus, you know, to me, cause it tastes the same is cause they showed me different ones. And I'm just like, yeah, those two things taste the same, uh, dirty draft lines versus, you know, um, yeah, water quality issues. And they're like, no, 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 they're very different flavors. And I'm like, okay, I trust you. Um, I'm just, I'm not seeing it right now. Yep. One of the things I've had to learn is to not stress out about it too much, you know, because we're geeking out and nitpicking every detail of the flavor profile. And then I give it to somebody else and they're like, this is amazing. And we're like, Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> you know, and it's and it's not that it isn't objectively great. It's just you can drive yourself crazy with all the nuances of it, and you know, to get a batch one hundred percent right, like you know, that's something that you work to over a lifetime. You know, it's and and over many years of experience, and it becomes a whole team effort. And in the meantime, the subtle details that. I'm nitpicking in order to improve our process. Nobody else notices. Like they're, they're so subtle, it's really good chocolate. So there's, again, it comes to that art and kind of balancing all the variables that are, that are happening. Uh, so actually, where do, you, where do you get most of your cacao beans from? I uh, source from Belize, Guatemala, Colombia, Tanzania, Uganda, and India currently. Okay. Yeah, and each of those is is a beautiful relationship in and of its own. We've learned a lot from each of the different countries that we've worked with and our suppliers there. Awesome. No, I was curious, sorry, because we did have an event a couple of weeks ago uh, with uh, the uh, cocoa bean sourcer for Hershey. Um, and he was talking about where, um, where beans are coming from for them. Um, we kind of... What I would say is most interesting about our supply chain is that we're not buying through the commodity market. Um, we actually buy direct from suppliers um, and we've just found that we're able to get much higher quality and give much better prices to our suppliers by circumventing the commodity market. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, and that does, um, you know, uh, as someone who's uh, done work with uh, refugees and immigrants myself, um, that does, I mean, I'm sure that does a huge amount in terms of local economy, um, you know, and that really perpetuating kind of um, improved educational outcomes and like opportunity. Um, and there's so much of that that goes, you know, just kind of because that's how those communities work, right? Is that they, the, that extra money that they're getting, they put right back into their neighbors, their family, um, and, you know, everyone around them. Yeah. Yeah, it goes a lot to uh, tropical ecosystem preservation too, because cacao is an agroforestry crop that um, can, can be grown in intact protected rainforest. And so giving people right livelihood to not need to destroy the rainforest through kind of the traditional avenues of cutting down timber or branching cattle or mining um, is, you know, we need practical economic alternatives that give people right livelihood to incentivize rainforest production. And that's what cacao can do, which is really cool. 
Yeah, so I now have a lot of uh, thoughts about the geopolitics of that as well, but we won't get into that because that's all I think that I feel like there's a whole other conversation. It's a rabbit probably. hole. Yeah. yeah, it's a rabbit hole conversation you probably have. Um, and then, uh, so you mentioned uh, sort of like tempering chocolate. Um, and so like, I, I mean, I know some about this, but there's a question, like, can you talk more about tempering chocolate? Sure. I totally skipped over that. The science of it is fascinating. Um, you can think of chocolate, like, just as an analogy, think of water, right? Water goes from liquid and then it becomes solid and then forms ice crystals along the way. Think of tempering. So chocolate naturally has five different types of ice crystal of crystals that it'll form as it solidifies. And the cool thing is those crystals, it's, it, it, you know, freezing doesn't happen. It doesn't go from solid to liquid in an instant. It's a gradual process. So you actually have liquid chocolate with seed crystals that are beginning to form, but because you're still circulating it and applying the heat, it's not solidifying. And so tempering is this process, you know, uh, chocolate solidifies at like 85, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Actually, it's a little lower than that, um, but it, it's, it's beginning to solidify at that point. So we're, we're like teetering right on the edge of the chocolate becoming solid in the pipes, um, which is not fun for us when it solidifies, but we're like basically trying to get it to be ready to set up so that when we put it on that belt, it'll solidify quickly enough by the time it gets to the end of the pipeline. Um, you can think of tempering as a process of seeding the liquid chocolate with the right kind of crystal that we want in this, in this we, we want the type five crystal, which actually has the highest melting point. And then that one actually sets up, it solidifies the fastest and then it's the most melt resistant um, and gives it that crack and that shine. Um, so basically the tempering process is a, we're bringing the temperature of the liquid chocolate down to seed it with the type five crystal. Um, you can actually think of it, you bring it down and, and you create all the different types of crystals at one to five, and then you melt off the lowest temperature crystals so that you have liquid chocolate just with the type five seed crystal. And then you maintain it at the perfect temperature to not knock it out of temper by the time it's, it's getting to that belt. And then you cool it at the right pit. So the cooling is actually a critical part of the tempering process as well. Um, and that's, that's how you get that chocolate bar with the shine and the snap. And um, if you've ever had a chocolate that's melted, like left it out in the sun or something, and then it's re-solidified and it gets all these different colors, you, you're having cacao butter bloom coming to the surface there and you're having different types of crystals forming because at that point it's an uncontrolled solidification process. And so tempering is basically a controlled solidification of, of liquid chocolate into hard chocolate. So you talked a lot about sort of how engineering has helped you um, in a, and so I'm going to change one of the questions a little bit. So in a very a much broader sense, um, what would you say are kind of like the biggest STEM skills that you have found to be most valuable and transferable as you've gone along your, you, you know, your career journey? I mean, on the really broad, like the way I look at engineering is that the discipline is far too large for any one person to ever learn all the different fields of engineering in a lifetime, right? So instead they teach you to be tremendously resourceful and to dive into a new field of engineering and learn how to solve problems in that really quickly. So it's, it's that resource, it's, it's like that, that ability to tackle problems and, and learn how to solve problems very quickly. Um, you know, just like I didn't learn anything about chocolate making school and nor were there very many manuals on chocolate making, but dove into this, began talking to, began talking to people who knew stuff, began visiting chocolate factories, began getting tools in the door, began reading through every single manual, you know, get the data sheet for the controller that's inside one of the cabinets, read that whole thing, figure out how to reprogram it to get it to do what I want, you know, just having that complete fluency with anything and, and that understanding of how the whole system fits together and, and being able to take it apart and tinker with any one aspect of it. Like, I feel like the engineering program gave, gave me the confidence to go do that and take things apart. And, you know, to get to that engineering program, it's all the math that goes into it, um, all the understanding of, of volume and flow rates and things like that, all the material science and things. So um, it, I, I feel very fortunate to say that I get to use a lot of what, when I, what I went to school for, even though I'm not in a like strictly engineering discipline. 
Uh, no, I definitely feel that. Uh, I studied biochemistry for undergrad and had no idea what I was going to do with it. And now I get to work with teachers all the time um, yeah. on science things, which is really exciting. Um, so I, I feel that immensely. Um, and I guess, actually, so and this came up a lot uh, in some presentations I hosted last week um, about kind of um, like, what's the hardest math they have to do? Because um, I think, uh, and there's this whole conversation we had about um, how, you know, this is huge push for like, you know, like really, really hard math. And um, a bunch of, then I had two engineers last week who were like, oh yeah, no, uh, the hardest math I'm ever gonna do is like algebra. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. Um, so what's the hardest math that you do? We, have, we definitely have some like differential equations and integration um, that comes into play mostly in the roast profile. Um, as we're, we're basically trying to calculate the, the to well, we're doing a lot with rate of rise and momentum of a roast. Um, you kind of think of roasting as, as like you're pushing on a gas pedal, but then the car doesn't stop when you let go of the gas pedal, it coasts. And so, so to control a roast, you really have to look at those, those differential rates. And then to calculate the total amount of heat that a cacao bean has seen over, over the time of that roast, you're, you're basically integrating uh, that roast curve. Um, so that, that's probably the most complex we've seen. Aside from the math, I've actually also done a fair bit of computer programming for the company, mostly on the web side of things. So that's also been very useful. Awesome. And I will do a last call for questions from our teachers. Um, and I mean, honestly, I could probably talk to you forever um, just because I um, have learned a fair amount of chocolate just from like, you know, my dad's work with, uh, yeah. you know, with because he did quality management. So he was doing a lot of the machine stuff, making sure the, you know, the machines were doing things cleanly. Um, and they were doing like chocolate products, so like truffles. Um, and like little hurt, little chocolate bars. Um, so, and I think it's fascinating. There's so many areas you can geek out on. Like we just, now that we're transferring chocolate over larger distances, we have all these chocolate pipelines, right? And after you transfer the chocolate through them, there's chocolate left in the pipeline. How do you get it out without taking the entire pipeline apart? It turns out there's this like whole subfield of like process engineering where they have these things called pigs which are plugs that they they're like silicone plugs with washers like basically like washers that you push through the pipelines with air pressure and so it squeegees out the inside of the pipe and then shoots out the other end and gets all the chocolate out so it's like the kind of thing you, you like are fascinated to discover and these are the same things they use in like oil pipelines and in beer facilities and such and you you just like never even think that that's how they clean a chocolate pipeline is by like sending this giant like silicone squeegee down it with air pressure so we're constantly like learning new things <laughs> and it's funny because you say that and i'm like yeah i mean that makes perfect sense to me based on everything i know about you know sort of food production and um you know using squeegees and other situations so i used to um i used to actually work at a pool and we had to clean we had to right. clean out everything every year right um and so there's all sorts of weird squeegee stuff that you have to do um so but yeah no that's really that's so interesting and that you know then goes back into like, okay, it improves our yield on a batch, you know, because we have a certain amount of process loss. And then it, that then feeds back into the economics of the company. Um, it's, it, it, it all connects in such fascinating ways. That's, that's what I really love about it. Um, awesome. Uh, so there were no more questions. Uh, just Dr. Schreiber, uh, you know, making sure we knew that, oh, it sounds like Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. It's a fun yeah, comment. <laughs> they, call me, they call me Jonas Wonka. <laughs> my friends used to call my dad Willy Wonka because I would bring giant, like, five-pound boxes of just, like, second chocolates to, to college with me. And they're okay. just like, what is this? Um, so, yeah. No, that's... that's I'm not, glad it's not the only one. Yeah, that's really cool that you've had that experience as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, if anybody wants to be in touch, feel free. Um, Jonas at oracacao.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at cacao ceremony is where we search or a cacao or a cacao online and you'll find the website and things like that. Mm -hmm.